was 13 the first time I realized I was Black. Of course, I had a cognitive recognition, but I didn't truly know what it meant until I was sitting in a math class, staring at neon pink chalk, processing what I had seen on CNN last night. I was 13 the first time I heard about a Black man being killed by police in America. I was 13 the first time I realized I was Black. We were having a class discussion after Eric Garner had been killed. I was 13 the first time I realized that to this world, our existence doesn't matter. And I was sitting, sobbing in a classroom while my teacher told me that Black Lives Matter is just a bunch of thugs, that police risk their lives every day, that failing to comply warrants death. I was 13 the first time I realized I was Black. And the funny thing is, they had spent 13 years indoctrinating me so that by then I was so poisoned and plagued by racism all around me, I didn't even know. I didn't even know I was Black. This led me on a journey, inspired by Twitter and activist Yara Shahidi. I wanted to know everything I could about Black history, Black experience, and injustice of every kind. I participated in debates and lobbied school administrators, attended conferences and joined advisory committees. I wrote plays, I spoke, I taught, armed with the information my friends and I learned from wiser change makers before us. By the time I was 17 and in the 12th grade, I was a bona fide social justice warrior. And I was proud of it, still am. I graduated from tweets to Ta-Nehisi Coates, from participating in seasonal movements to critical race theory. I was educated and I was educating. I was inspired and I was inspiring others. I was change-making, but I was tired. There's an interesting study in the Journal of Human Rights Practice entitled Burnout in Social Justice and Human Rights Advocates, where they surveyed activists and found that all had experienced some measure of burnout and eventually left their activism. The number one symptom they reported, exhaustion. While most eventually returned, this study and the innumerable amount of other ones of similar result highlight a startling fact. The current way that we approach activism is utterly unsustainable. In our culture, every time we open our phones, we're inundated with images, stories, hashtags, reasons, reasons to do the work, reasons to care. Personally, I always felt like this was a good thing, a positive impact of globalization that gave more people access to change-making tools and a way to demand accountability. I still believe those things. However, now I understand that this powerful tool, digital activism and organization, the tool that is quite literally working to save our lives and grant us justice could also be unintentionally bringing us harm. We don't get a break from the images of our brutalization. They color our timelines and our TVs. We talk about them in conversation. They become inescapable. We begin to feel weary tired of constantly being asked to campaign, constantly being asked to put our bodies on the front lines, ready to defend everyone and everything. But have you ever asked yourself, who defends us? The answer is you. What I found on my journey by about year three or four is that I had no more words to give. I had no more hope to deal. I had no more speeches to deliver to crowds of blankly staring white faces. I was burnt out. I thought that in order to make this world better, I had to sacrifice myself, and that is simply untrue. In the words of the NAP ministry, our rest is resistance. In a culture that has been propertizing black bodies since the 15th century, taking ownership over your body, your space, your conversations, and your time is revolutionary. Black bodies are not frontline soldiers. They're not an indestructible line of defense. I realized that you are most useful to the causes that you care about when you're allowed to become more than just your pain. You are most useful to the people you care about when you can care about yourself. So what does this look like? It looks like owning your physical and digital space, not feeling obligated to participate in every discourse, not feeling like you have to spend 24 hours a day online. For a lot of us, social media is not a relaxing space. 
Just because you're sitting on a couch scrolling doesn't mean your mind isn't working. Working to process the overwhelming amount of trauma it ingests at record speed. In today's climate, our minds are expected to process information at the speed of light. We rise, we react, we resist, we rage, but we're never expected to remember. We're never expected to take a collective breath after the uproar, the hashtags, the protests. We're expected to return to school and work on Monday morning and just push forward. We're not given time to reflect. A whirlwind month of virality isn't enough time to do a deep unpacking of the hurt that we've experienced now and historically, and the wounds we've ignored and the future we hope to see. Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tamir Rice, Tatiana Jefferson, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Trayvon Martin, Rayshard Brooks, Stefan Clark, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling. And right at home in our own backyard, DeAndre Campbell and Regis Korchinski Paquette. By my estimation, the proper collective grieving time for just one of these traumatic losses is at the very least a year. Not three months, not three days. Our souls do not move at the speed of Instagram. Take a breath, unclench your jaw, relax your shoulders. Even our bodies are telling us they're holding on to too much. We're not comfortable with that though. We're not used to slowing down, breathing, grieving. It makes us uncomfortable. Please become okay with being uncomfortable with having healing conversations, with seeking help when you need it, with resting, with not being engaged in every conversation, with listening to your heart and your mind when it tells you you need to unplug. This fight that we're fighting, the fight towards a more equitable world is one for the long haul. We're not going to dismantle these issues overnight. It's going to require all of us. And in order for us to persevere, we have to protect our hearts and our minds from restlessness, hopelessness, and becoming burnt out. You are the owner of your joy. You are allowed to remove yourself from the digital space. You are allowed to have boundaries with your time and your energy. You're allowed to shape your future. You're allowed to keep hoping and inspire others to do the same. As for me, I must acknowledge that the idea that rest is essential for social justice is not new. I'm not the first one to explore this concept. You must continue learning about rest and activism from veterans in this fight and allow your daily joy, daily rest and daily peace to shine as bright as our rage does. Allow it to help you break down barriers, to educate, to dismantle systems of oppression. Allow the pursuit of justice to inspire you rather than hurt you. And I don't take this lightly. I know firsthand that social activism and dismantling anti-Black racism is challenging and emotionally grueling work. It is not glamorous or lighthearted. It is a caring pursuit that requires us to wear our community's pain over and over again in order to create change. But it should not require you to sacrifice yourself in the process. Imagine for a minute how much more hope you could give in your community and to whatever cause you serve if you were rested, recovered, joyful, passionate, controlled, and engaged in healing. I persist in this fight because I refuse to allow my activism, my body, my mind to become property to the systems I am trying to dismantle. In the words of Elaine Walter Roth, when the world tells you to shrink, expand. At a young age, Gen Z, unlike any generation before us, is inundated with causes and things to care about from climate change to women's rights to racial justice to international politics. It's excellent, but it's also dangerous. Don't let the world force you into participating into activism onto death. Be earnest, be compassionate, be engaged, be a change maker, but remember that community care starts with self-care. 
I was 19 when I realized that against all forces that try to worry us, strip us of our humanity, make us into machines, dissuade us from our causes, and burn us out from our communities, rest is our way towards a more equitable world. Let us resist by coloring our activism in the joy, love, and hope we experience in our lives. Thank you.